Everyone, welcome back to the Tuned and Strong podcast. I am Angela McHuston of Music Strong, joined by my co-host. I am Dr. Jen Cabas May of Tuned and Tone Performance. And today we are joined by a special guest. Uh, I'm going to let her pronounce her name because I already butchered <laughs> it once today. So <laughs> let's um, let's not have that happen again. Uh, Dr. Nadia is about as far as I'm going to go. And <laughs> can you introduce yourself, please? Perfect. No problem. Uh, hi, everyone. And thank you for having me on today. Uh, my name is Dr. Nadia Azar. I am an associate professor of kinesiology at the University of Windsor in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And I am the founder and director of the Drummer Lab, which Drummer stands for Drummer Mechanics and Ergonomics Research. Okay. That's what we do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's just drummers, right? Yes. Uh, but I actually have a student who is branching out a little bit. Um, she's going to be doing a study on conductors. Um, so yeah, That'll be that one's coming up soon, but, but typically, uh, the work that we do is on drummers. Yeah. Okay. So how did you, how did you get to the point where that's your specialty is drummers plus uh, kinesiology. And, and I'm sorry if I butchered that one. I don't, I spell it fine, but saying it okay. scares me. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, it was, it was a very serendipitous series of events that led to this. Um, so I, I've been in my position since 2008. Um, I've been doing research since even further before that. And I had thought about dabbling in research on drummers or musicians. It's just sort of come up throughout my career, but never really got into it until uh, one day I had a Twitter interaction with Mike Mangini, who is the drummer for the progressive rock band Dream Theater and a, a virtuoso drummer in his own right. Um, and so I'm, I'm a huge fan of Dream Theater and I follow him and he posted something on Twitter about drumming, being sore because drumming was like a boxing type workout. And I thought, OK, I have to say something. I can't just let that slide. So I, I tweeted back at him that I was a researcher in kinesiology and I'd love to study his technique and to message me if he was interested, hoping to get like the little like and that would be the end of it. Uh, but he messaged me, he private, he responded to the tweet and private messaged me and we went back and forth, um, had a Skype conversation. And uh, once at that point I was kind of gung ho. So I started digging into the research literature to see what would had been done. And the answer was virtually nothing. Um, a handful of studies out of Japan and out of Scandinavia, um, the Clem Burke project out of the UK. But other than that, not a whole lot. Um, so since my background and, and training is in ergonomics and injury prevention, I, I kind of started there, um, which led to the, uh, I did a big online survey of drummers experiences with playing related musculoskeletal disorders. Um, but at the same time, uh, shortly, maybe a couple of months after that original tweet storm, Mike said something again about, uh, you know, musing about how many calories he burns during a show. So by this point, we were already in touch. So I emailed him right away and I said, like, listen, I've got this equipment in my lab. We, we could totally do this and find out pretty easily um, if, if you're up for it. And he was. So on their next tour, so it was about a year after our original interaction, um, they were on tour in my area. And so I went to a couple of their shows and I hooked them up with my devices during the show and got data <laughs> on him. And then uh, a couple others heard about it and it just kind of took off from there. And at this point I've, I've measured uh, I've, or I've, I've recorded data on 40 professional drummers in live performance situations. Nice. That's so incredibly awesome. I mean, I've seen these <laughs> stats that you post and they are mind blowing the amount of calories these guys, right? Don't you also have heart rate and uh, BPM and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. I, so uh, about a few months after the study started, I added in a heart rate monitor. So I use the, the Polar heart rate monitor. You can buy it at any sporting goods store, um, but it is research grade. So I throw that on them now as well. And so I can get the energy expenditure estimates with the armbands, the body media armbands. And then I also use the heart rate to kind of support the energy data, but also because each of them has their, their sort of pitfalls, 
um, the heart rate data kind of provides me with another set of evidence um, that I can kind of use. And I, I kind of analyze it according to the ACSM guidelines of, you know, what constitutes uh, mild, moderate intensity, uh, high intensity exercise based on their, their heart rate as a percentage of their max. Um, so, yeah, so I do, I post all of it on my social media, which is what you would have seen. And uh, yeah, it, it is pretty astounding. Um, the numbers that they get up to particularly, I mean, the calories are one thing, but the heart rate, I mean, I've had people, I've had people maxing at like 196 beats per minute and averaging in the one sixties, one seventies, I, th I think the highest average, no, I don't know what the highest average is, but I think overall the average is in the one seventies somewhere in there. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Jeez. Yeah. You know, I have to wonder if um okay, so drummers are are a whole other ball game, you know, they've been using both arms, both legs. I mean, they just which blows my mind how they can even coordinate like that. But yeah. I I have always wondered, you know, if there are um if classical musicians end up at least solo performances, if any of us are in the same ballpark. I mean, you throw nerves on there on top of it. Like we're not, we're not, you know, banging around cymbals and, and bass drums and all that stuff. But I, mm -hmm. I have to wonder what our heart rates are. Has anybody done any kind of research on that? Or do you have any idea? So the only evidence I have, and it's not really great because it's only one participant, but I did have a drummer who he was uh, drumming for Dear Evan Hansen in Toronto. So it was musical theater. Um, which is not classical, but it's not like rock show either. Um, so, you know, in those, I think it partly depends on the playing style of the drummer and also on the genre of music. So this particular drummer, mm -hmm. his heart rate was very low throughout um, and his energy expenditure was low because it was mostly, you know, there's, there was a handful of songs, but then other than that, it was just sort of like the, the transitions, you know, the 10 seconds of music while they're changing scenes and things. So it was, it was very, you know, very low intensity. Um, but, you know, I, I suspect in more intense classical pieces, they would get up a little higher. Uh, certainly adrenaline would have an impact. Actually, one set of data I have that's really interesting is uh, Todd Suchman, who is the drummer for Styx. Um, so Styx is a rock band. It's, and, and it's a pretty, you know, high energy uh, music. And Todd's heart rate was the only person who was lower than him was the musical theater drummer because Todd has worked for years on keeping, well, first of all, keeping his movements very efficient. So he's not all over the place, uh, keeps things in tight, keeps things very efficient, but also uh, relaxing both body, but also mind and breathing and controlling sort of his, his, uh, yeah, I guess his, his physiological response. And he had always said like, you know, I do this, I do this, I do this. And then I gave him the numbers to go with it. And, and he was like, wow, like he could actually see the evidence of it. So I think it has to do with a lot of different things. Um, so, but I would, I would love to be able to get, you know, more of the different genres. I, prior to COVID, I had like 10 more people lined up to do this and I was starting to branch out into other avenues besides rock, but I would love to get classical, more musical theater, you know, more intense musical theater than maybe this, like one where it's a full musical as opposed to Dear Evan Hansen has a lot of just uh, like acting in it as opposed to the musical component. So yeah, that'd be super interesting, but I, I haven't seen anything uh, other than, other than that, I haven't seen any research literature on it. I'm going to yeah. wear my heart rate monitor at my next, um, con uh, concert now, just to find out. I used to have one of those body <laughs> media armbands. Is that what you're talking Did about you? from, um, body media? They're, they've been around for like 20 years, right? Yeah. I don't know how long they were around for, but they sold, the company was bought out by, I think it's called Jawbone. Um, <sighs> okay. probably seven years ago ish. Um, so unfortunately those monitors are no longer in circulation. They, they took the technology and they don't, they don't do anything with it now. Um, they didn't incorporate, from what I can tell, they didn't incorporate it into their own tech. So, um, 
Yeah, but but those were and they were used extensively in research uh, up until I mean, they still are. Uh, we have a bunch at our uh, institution that we use, but lots of people have used them for monitoring activities of daily living and other sporting activities and things like that. So, yeah, yeah really I was nice just using it. I, I was just using it to, to figure out what is my actual daily caloric burn? What is I wanted to see, you know, what are my actual calories when I, you know, this is back when I was a little obsessive. What does it look like when I'm exercising? What is my caloric burn, like epoch after I'm exercising? How long does that last? And, you know, it also tracked your sleep. If this is mm -hmm. the same, it was a body, maybe it was a body bug. This was like early 2000s. Uh, maybe it's not yeah, the same think... thing, but it was by body media. So I'm curious if it's okay. the same the thing. Yeah, I don't think this one tracks sleep, but maybe it did. I just don't, I, we never, I've never used it for that. So maybe it does. And I just don't know it because I wasn't paying attention, <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's a great little device. I wish they, I wish they did make them because eventually ours are going to wear out and then I'm going to have to <laughs> move on to something different. So, yeah. 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 So I'm going to do my backtrack thing unless, unless we got, okay. <laughs> I figured you would. I was going to run you know? <laughs> Yeah, my, my, uh, my thing is backtracking and then um, expanding like I've never looked into you at all. So, um, you know, in case anybody out there is listening who has no idea, <laughs> they're not just in the dark. Um, we kind of already covered, yes, you pretty much, sounds like, um, exclusively work on um, rock drummers. Um, with that that little bit of exception and you're branching out. So we covered question number one. <laughs> for. But um, so it sounds like your your research and maybe I'm wrong here. So let's put that out there to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is it predominantly on energy uh, during a show? Um, have you gone into the practice room? Do we branch and out to the um, other things? I know you said you had a background in injury. Um, mm -hmm. What is what does the rest of that look like? So the energy expenditure study is actually only one part of our research program. Um, and so far we have only, uh, we have only worked with professional drummers in live performance situations. Like I said, mostly rock drummers, but some country, some pop. Um, so that one is kind of that, but the, the whole other arm of the research that we do, and arguably it's a bigger component just not as flashy, um, is, <laughs> is the injury prevention uh, and the, the ergonomics and injury prevention uh, part of it. So that survey that I was talking about, um, it was an online survey. I had over uh, nearly 900 drummers from around the world fill it out um, and uh, got all kinds of great data on uh, you know, how many, how many of them had experienced a playing related injury in their lifetime and in the last year and in the last seven days and, and that sort of thing. And question, I had all kinds of questions about their lifestyle characteristics, their playing habits, their all kinds of stuff. So I could sort of try to start looking at relationships between reporting an injury and these different characteristics. Um, from that, we've already started branching out based on the results of those studies um, to dig deeper. So one of the things, so one of the results that came out of that study is that as you may imagine, upper limb injuries are a huge problem for drummers. 59% uh, of the people in my study reported having had an upper limb injury at some point. Um, so we figured, okay, that's, that's where we got to start. So we, uh, one of my students did a study where she did motion capture, three-dimensional motion capture on drummers while they were playing. We brought people into our lab. We hooked them up in our motion capture system and we looked at their postures, their upper limb postures uh, while they were playing and compared that to some ergonomic tools that have sort of standards for what's considered, uh, you know, uh, neutral elbow, wrist, shoulder flexion, mildly flex, you know, severe flexion, things like that and extension too. Um, so we, we did some work with that and I have uh, a couple students right now who are working on their master's thesis projects. One of them is looking at, he's, he's quantifying, um, vibration exposure in drummers. So as you can imagine, you hit wood sticks on metal rims and cymbals and even the drum heads and you get like shock waves, but also vibration coming up through your hands. Um, which we know is a risk factor for injury. And in fact, it's a risk factor for two of the most common 
injuries that were reported in my survey, tendonitis and carpal tunnel syndrome. I was just about to ask if you had, if those were like the ones that came up of what were the most common prevalent injuries that you found? Yeah. So those were the two I asked, um, not to, cause I didn't want really like self report. I mean, even though it was all self-reported, but I wanted to try to get at more than just like, oh, I'm pretty sure I've got tendonitis. So I asked specifically, did you get a medical diagnosis, like a diagnosis from a medical professional? And if so, what was it? And so from those answers, uh, tendonitis, uh, not necessarily, I mean, I'm assuming upper limb tendonitis, but it could have been at any part uh, of the body, but tendonitis and then carpal tunnel syndrome were the two most common diagnoses. Um, so we, uh, back to the vibration study, we want to look at um, what, what are the levels of vibration exposure when people are playing the drums and how do those compare to industrial standards that we use to set limits on how much people can be exposed in the workplace. Um, so that one's ongoing right now. And then my other student is now his is more, not so much ergonomics and injury prevention, but more performance. So he is going to be looking at a muscle activation patterns of the trunk and the upper limb during high intensity, like high velocity cymbal strikes. Um, because we're looking for a particular pattern that you see in athletes who use ballistic movements like MMA fighters, golfers, uh, baseball pitchers, and I think batting too, they show this particular type of muscle activation pattern that is related to being able to like an efficient way of maximizing the velocity of their strike to get the most force. And so we're going to be looking for that. Uh, that one, we're just, we're going through the, the steps to get our research approved with all our new COVID protocols and stuff like that. So that should be starting up in the next month or so. Um, but that's kind of what we've got going on. So really like the energy expenditure part of it is just, you know, one cool. little piece yeah. Yeah, of, yeah. of the whole picture. Cool. And before you go down the rabbit hole, um, can I ask a quick question? You mentioned yeah. upper limb and, uh, upper limb injuries. What about, mm -hmm. cause I, I know these guys, they're, they're playing set. I mean, they use their, they use both both legs. Do you have any kind of data on like ankles or hips or low back or any of that kind of stuff? Does that, does that come up? Yeah. So low back was actually the second. So the wrist was the most frequency re or frequently reported area uh, of the body with that was injured. The low back was the next one. And they were, it was like 25% of the group had a wrist injury at some point and 24% were the lower back. Um, the leg, the, the legs, like hips, knees, ankles, it did come up, but because it, it was, it was less than, they were less than 20%, all of them. Mm -hmm. So because the, the back and the upper limb really came up the most frequently, I I've kind of targeted those. So I haven't really gone down those roads yet. Although I, I would like to, at some point, the one I was surprised about was that the neck didn't it, it was, it was a pretty low percentage of neck injuries and I've watched people play <laughs> and I'm really surprised that neck pain doesn't come up more often, but it, I can't remember the exact percentage at the moment, but it was not really substantial. So. I think with the head banging, there'd be a little more, but maybe not. <laughs> you would maybe the head banging so. keeps them looser, you know? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, but even at that, like maybe too much, you know, I yeah. like get some hypermobility in there. And I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I do know of one drummer who actually uh, had a stroke that was induced by head banging while playing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Take note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, I mean, if you get too far into it, it can right. potentially, I think that's pretty rare, yeah. but it did yeah. happen. You know, so <laughs> yeah, not so you real, but I, it's, not, it's not funny, but like, man, it's, yeah. it's not, it's one of those things like, it's I shouldn't laugh at that. Terrible. It's like, what do you, what else? What, it, like, that's your first reaction of, oh my gosh. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's so astounding that that could happen that yeah. you laugh just because it's like, what? Right. <laughs> just the, the concept seems absurd, even though like, I understand biologically why it would be a thing, you know, just, yeah. you but, know, you don't, you don't expect that. <laughs> no, no, you don't. 
The low back makes a lot of sense though, because yeah. uh, just looking in the, the little bit of research I've done with drummers, nowhere close to what you've been doing, but just looking at their posture um, at set, not, not talking about percussionists, but we're talking strictly about drummers here. Um, mm. It's, uh, there's not a lot of, um, they need a good bit of core strength and a lot of them from what I, the pictures I'm seeing, they don't have it. So it's going to go yeah. to the low back. You know, and when you're when you're might not be balanced on the throne or you have a this is a, 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 a client of mine is a drummer. And he mentioned this quite a bit that choice that throne choice makes a big difference in how you feel injury prevention, that whole bit, because if you get a cheap mm -hmm. throne, then you're having to compensate for it. Yeah. I'm not the sure wobbly. If that yeah. The wobbly seat. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And one of, so this didn't come out in my study, but one of the others um, that has been done, a study out of Australia, they had drummers reported that um, setting, like lugging their gear was a major source yeah. of back pain for them. Mm -hmm. um, which makes total sense because, you know, they want to take as few trips as possible. First of all, you know, they have tons of pieces yeah. and they're heavy, like a cymbal mm -hmm. bag, even with mm -hmm. only like five cymbals in it, it's pretty heavy. And yeah. then the stands are really heavy and, you know, people don't want to, they want to make as few trips as possible. So they load everything up all at once mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they're doing this night after night and, it, you know, poor posture and they're awkward and shifting loads and all the, all the things are there to, to put them at risk of an injury. So yeah, I, I wasn't surprised that the low back came up. Yeah. 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 I was actually surprised that it was as low as it was. I, I kind of thought it might actually be higher, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was still substantial. Oh my gosh. With, with those percentages though, um, what was the, and, and maybe this is not a good question. So again, like, <laughs> but what was, what was the, um, did they have like a definition for injury? Was it like any sort of recurring discomfort or pain or was it like they needed a diagnosis? They didn't need a diagnosis, but they were given a definition of what would constitute a playing related musculoskeletal disorder. So okay. it was okay. worded in such a way as to make it very clear that I'm not talking about blisters from drumsticks. Right. Um, I'm not talking about bashing your knuckles, you know, splitting them open right, on your right, snare. Right. Um, yes. you know, those sorts of things. I was talking mm -hmm. about, you know, the kinds of things that develop over time as a result of mm -hmm. repetitive use. Mm -hmm. I, I had a, de a formal definition that they were given, yeah. um, that also like, you know, I'm not talking about slips and falls or, you know, anything right. like that. It's, right. it's gotta be related to playing. So, yeah. Right. Um, I I'm more thinking, um, and again, I'm, I'm legitimately asking here, not trying to impart or, or lead. Um, yeah, I'm more thinking though about, um, from what I've personally come across, a lot mm -hmm. of people um, don't think of themselves as having an injury. You know what I mean? Like, oh, well, my wrist flares up every once in a while, or, oh, well, you know, sometimes I'm, my low back twinges, but that's, that's just a thing. It's not related to what I do. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if that was potentially. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I suppose it could. Uh, I mean, that's the problem with survey research, right? Like you, yeah, yeah. you capture a lot, but you also miss right. a lot. I'm actually right. going to pull up the definition because I just, wanna, I haven't looked at it in a while and I want to make sure that I um, actually give the right information here. But so I won't read the whole definition because it's kind of long, but I want to double check something because I think they were given. Yeah. So they were given the, the caveat or part of the definition was that the symptoms had to interfere with their ability to play at the level that they're accustomed to. Okay. So it may have actually had the opposite effect as it may have actually precluded some people or, or maybe, yeah, it would have missed yeah. people like that. were like, Oh, you know, once in a while, it's not a big deal, but that's yeah. actually what I was yeah. targeting was people who yeah. were like, no, this is something that like, took you off your playing or made it really mm -hmm. difficult or, you know, those kinds of things, because okay. I actually wanted to make sure I didn't get, you know, the, yeah. like the, the ones where it's like, oh, once in a while. And cause once in a while yeah. soreness is to be expected, but you know, soreness right. that interferes with your playing is, or your life is a major problem. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That makes sense. Uh, off lessons. sense. I'm thinking particularly about a drummer that I know, a high level drummer. And he told me the other day, he's like, oh, I've had carpal tunnel syndrome for decades. I'm like, decades? He goes, yeah, yeah, look, here's an article I was, it was written up or I wrote this article about me and um, another drummer that he met and how it, it just, it blows my mind that you can deal with something for that long um, mm. and just think that's part of the gig. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that goes back to like the whole culture of, you know, pain is part of the like you say, it's, it's part of the gig yeah. and it doesn't have to be like yeah. some, yes, when you're, you know, when you haven't played in a long time or you've like really ramped up your practicing because you've got a performance coming or whatever it is, you're going to experience muscle soreness. You, you might get some bursitis or things like that, um, which will, you know, if you back down again, it'll go away. But the idea that like, you have to play yeah. through pain or that it should, like, if you're not doing it, if it's not painful, you're not doing it right. Or something like that is, is not accurate. And yeah. you know, that, that kind of, but I, I think that's shifting a lot, but I think it's taken a while for it to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm seeing that more and more like in our, in our field of performance health, just the field itself is starting to come up to a level where before it was just kind of this fringe thing that only certain people had to deal with and mainstream musicians didn't talk about it. It's just, that's for people who get injured. Mm. Yeah. Not this many of us, like up to 90%. It's yeah. insane. It's an insane, which is basically everybody. I mean, you, you go into a room and you ask people, uh, ask musicians, who here has had a playing related injury or ever experienced pain as a result of playing your instrument mm -hmm. on somewhat of a recurring basis or an injury, nine out of 10 hands are going to go up every time yeah. I've given a workshop, it's the exact same thing. And we just mm -hmm. think it's part of it with numbers that high, of course you think that, but it, you know, yeah. so it's not this fringe thing anymore. I'm really glad to see um, things like what you're doing and you're showing, uh, showing just how athletic being a drummer is, I mean, we kind of know it in the back of our heads, but the seeing the data yeah. on the screen that you're showing is yeah. so it's like I said before, it's just, it's mind blowing. The amount of calories, the amount of energy expenditure, the, the, um, the heart rate being as high as it is, mm -hmm. you know, and these, these are, these concerts are not 20 minutes. There are hours. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Musicians are athletes. <laughs> totally. And, and that's been, I think why part of why I've, I've kept doing this part of it is I, so it's, it's evidence to show that, right? Like you, and I mean, I didn't really think about it this way until I got into it. So I don't really blame them for not thinking this way, but yeah, it, you, you are doing something very physically demanding. And if you don't, train your body to handle it it's not yeah. going to it's yeah. going to break down and and cause problems um so it's you know it, it's been really nice to be able to have that in that data to kind of hammer that home to yeah. people um yeah. and even like i give each drummer their their data set so they have it they can do whatever they want with it um you know i know some of them have taken it to their their doctors their cardiac uh, or their cardiovascular, I'm drawing a blank on the word now, but like their, their cardio guy, their <laughs> not surgeon, but you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, you know, to say like, this is what's happening when I play, like, is this okay? <laughs> you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I, I think as more and more people kind of realize that, um, mm -hmm that, that, <clears throat> excuse me, fitness and not fitness isn't like, you don't have to be like, this ripped athlete kind of thing, but, but right. preparing your body to handle mm -hmm. that demand, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, is super important and is going to contribute to the longevity of, of your career and the enjoyability of your career. You yes. know, who wants to, it sucks to play when you don't feel good. Like, why would you want to live like that? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and put yourself through that when, if you can build yourself up to be able to handle that, that workload, it, it won't be as hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think this right here, what you just said needs to be our uh, teaser clip for the show. <laughs> it was, it was perfect. Uh, really was. Um, and on that yeah. note, 
I think that's a perfect time for us to take a quick commercial break from one of our sponsors, and we will be right back. Hey there. My name is Dr. Garrett Hope. I am a composer, coach, podcaster, and speaker. I've been focused on building my music business since 2014 and helping others build theirs since 2015. I want to tell you about the second annual Ultimate Music Business Summit we are organizing. It'll take place early January of 2022. There will be dozens of presentations with highly actionable content, all of it available to you so you can start your business, grow your business, and ultimately make more money. Because here's the deal. Unless you earn all of your income from an employer, you are a self-employed small business owner. And if you want to do more than survive, if you want to grow your audience, or if you want to impact more people, you have to think and act like a business owner. And that means this summit is for you. This summit will give you real world, not theoretical strategies you can implement immediately. You don't need to be stuck with fear or living in your failures. I promise you, with all the teachers lined up, you will get something you've never thought of before. Even though building a business is hard, no one is promising it's easy. It is possible. You just need the right tools and strategies. Tickets for this virtual event will go on sale soon. To be the first in line and to get more information about the summit, presenters, and more, go to musicsummit.biz. That's musicsummit.biz and add your email to the list. All right. And we are back with the Tune Dan Strong podcast with Dr. Nadia Azar. Um, before the break, we were talking about um, basically musicians needing to train their body the way that athletes do in order to handle their performances and their practice sessions and basically everything we do for a living. Um, so just kind of as a, as a follow-up to that, I know you've still got your studies in progress, but um, what sort of uh, what sort of things have you found that people can do or, or resources that they could look at so that they can help uh, prepare their bodies? That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. Um, so I, I'm always, I always like to refer people to the right professionals. And I think a lot of people just, they want to do these things, but don't know where to start. Um, so I, you know, if, if someone is looking to get started on a fitness program, you know, they can reach out to fitness trainers at their local gyms or, you know, companies, yeah, <laughs> consultants and companies like yours <laughs> who specialize in this kind of thing. Um, if they are dealing with a specific, like with an injury, I mean, I get, I get emails and, and DMS all the time asking, like, I've got this thing going on. And I'm like, I'm not that kind of doctor. I can't help you with that. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just kind of overstepping my bounds there. But um, so I always refer them out to, you know, talk to physiotherapists uh, or athletic therapists about what you can do to help, uh, you know, mitigate that injury. But then, and this is where I come in, is, you know, it, it's one thing to go through the rehab and, um, you know, get rid of the injury. But if you're not going to change your lifestyle habits, your practice habits, if you're not going to change whatever it is that set you up for that injury in the first place, you're going to give me right back to where you started. So this is where, uh, you know, the, the fitness professionals and the trainers come in to help build up their bodies, but also where people with a background in ergonomics come in who can help you look at the way you're playing and identify points of stress, whether that's, you know, awkward postures or non-neutral, or you're, you're holding too much tension or these things to kind of help point those things out to you and help make suggestions for, you know, if you just move that symbol down here a little bit, you don't have to reach so far. And, you know, those sorts of things to, to help you change the things that might've been leading to the problem in the first place. Um, so those are the, the people that I suggest you look to. Um, there are some online resources. Um, there are a couple of books, like specifically for drummers, uh, John Lamb's Anatomy of Drumming is a great resource. Um, I've written a couple of articles for Drumeo. Um, actually, one, which I'm very fortunate that one of my grad students is a certified Canadian athletic therapist. So, yeah, which is great. So he and I co-wrote an article um, that I can send the link to, but we basically went through and talked about here's some ways that you can try to manage, uh, you know, your, your symptoms 
things you can do before you play, while you're playing, after you're done playing, uh, and in between performances and practices to help you, you know, manage and, and minimize your pain. Or if you don't have those things yet, to help you try to prevent some of that from happening. So, you know, we talk about things like, you know, making sure you do a proper warm up. Um, and by proper warm up, I don't mean just tapping on a, a practice pad for a few minutes. I mean, an actual physical warm up, and we're talking about like five minutes, not half an hour, you know, five minutes of a dynamic warm up, get your, your heart pumping, get your blood flowing, and then get on your instrument or your practice pad and, and do the more skill specific warm up to warm up the smaller muscle groups. Um, you know, if you're having pain, we talk about, uh, you know, applying some heat to the area for a few minutes, um, to, you know, sort of help again, increase circulation and relax muscles, reduce stiffness, things like that. Um, during playing, we talk about finding ways to incorporate breaks into your playing, which is really tough during a performance. Um, yeah. but there are ways to do it. You know, you, I call them micro breaks. So you have, you know, these short pauses in between songs, it may only be a few seconds, but that's enough time to get some wrist circles in, to do some, you know, mm -hmm. to loosen up those tight areas. Um, and even in parts during the song, like if you have a break where there's not a whole lot happening in the percussion section or for other, other instrumentalists, you know, there's a part where the guitarist is having a solo. That's a great time to get some stretches in. Um, you know, it's, it's not long and it doesn't have to be, it just needs, you just need to break up that, that time spent in those particular postures, um, making sure you cool down. I, I couldn't believe it on my survey. I, well, I kind of could believe it, but I, I really kind of couldn't also when I, I asked people how often they cool down after playing, <laughs> it was like, Rats never. players are the only people I know. It, it like. was, it, I think it was a ranking out of five with like five being never and one being always. And the average was like four point something. Mm -hmm. it, it was so low. When you're done, you, so pack it, like you leave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just like, what you mean? Like get off, get off the stage, pack up my stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. I, we, we talk a bit about like what a cool down. And again, it's like five minutes. It doesn't have to be much, but an intentional, cooling down, you know, bringing down your heart rate, uh, you know, doing some static stretching at that point while your muscles are warm to help loosen that up. Um, and then, and we give some exam in the article, we link to some videos of like how to do certain stretches and whatnot. Um, and then what to do in between like some, and they're very basic exercises, but like some, some shoulder blade squeeze exercises to get those retractors engaged. Um, what to do for, um, to loosen up the, uh, transverse ligament for your carpal tunnel. Uh, Dylan has this great exercise where it's like, just like getting a, a wine cork and resting it on table and then just rolling over top of it and how that can help stretch out that ligament and create a little more space, take the pressure off the nerves in and the tendons that run through there. Um, so there, there's, there's lots of little things that can be done, but I, I think people just don't know where to start and what to do. Yeah. Um, which is hopefully where some of the work that we're doing is coming in and some of the resources that we're, we're trying to put together can help people um, incorporate these more, more regularly into their routine. Absolutely. Yeah. And so when you're doing these studies, um, my first question is why did you pick rock drummers? And the second question or, or drummers period, as opposed to any other um, instrument. And the second mm -hmm. is, what going back off what you just said what's your end goal with this research is there anything that you really want to accomplish through this or that you want us to know yeah so why did i why did i pick drummers and rock drummers in particular um one is i'm a huge fan of rock music <laughs> so <laughs> that just sort of like fit naturally um and but also like it, it kind of grew organically in that direction because I started with rock drummers. So the first two drummers that I worked with were Mike Mangini and uh, Jeff Burroughs of the Tea Party. And which is, I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're a Canadian rock band. They've been around for a long time. Um, fantastic. So, but then it, it like snowballs. So, you know, oh, I told my friend about this. And I told my, you got to do mm -hmm. this person. You got to mm -hmm. talk to this person. And I just ended up with all these, all these rock drummers. Um, and that's kind of how I'm branching into the other genres as well. Um, you know, I've got 
a couple country drummers and then they hooked me up with their friends and it was starting to snowball until COVID hit. Um, why drummers in general? Um, they're fascinating. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's so much going on. Um, I think because, I mean, part of it was again, just the serendipity of this I mean, if, if, if the comment had come from their guitar player, it might've ended up with guitarists, you know, right. who knows, right. but it, uh, it just kind of happened that way. But I have been around the drums a lot in my life. I mean, my husband plays the drums. His brother is a semi-professional drummer. I have a couple uncles who played in bands. I played a little bit when I was a kid. So it's, it's just kind of always been around. Um, and so when this came up, it just kind of fit, um, and, and I think drummers are also a different breed. Um, I, I have yet to come across a drummer that I didn't like. <laughs> that, that wasn't like, that wasn't just a great experience to work with. I think they just tend to be a really like engaged and friendly and supportive and interesting group. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I think I'm not, I'm not sure if it would have gotten as you know, big and as quickly as it did with another group. Um, I don't know that for sure, but that's, that's kind of, you know, I just kind of fell into it that way. But, uh, but I think, you know, there's something about drummers as a group that, that just makes this, you know, a lot of fun and, and wanted mm -hmm. to do more. As for the end game, that's hard to say, because I mean, there's so, I, I won't see the end game because there's just so much to be done. Um, but I'm just trying to chip away at the knowledge gap that's out there for drummers. Um, you know, I, I, I like to say that I'm trying to do for drummers what sports science has done for athletes and, you know, help them to deliver their peak performance while reducing the risk of injury. And I guess that's my end game. It's a very broad end game. Um, but I'm just going to keep doing research and, and trying to disseminate it as widely as possible to kind of, you know, advance towards that goal. And hopefully as more and more people come on board in performing arts medicine and with drummers and percussionists specifically that, you know, that gap will start to close, but yeah, that's, that's kind well, of where I'm even at even as woodwind players, we need, we need your data. <laughs> like, you know, like, I mean, all, all of More, the, please. all the research yeah. I did for my treatise. And I know we talked to, um, was it Hannah? It was Hannah who got her doctorate also and, and said this about her research, right? Corsinor? Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe. Yes. Yeah. It was a Corsinor. Anyway, anyway, um, <laughs> might have been Madeline. either case, I I, it, it might've been, I can't remember. Um, Either way, it was like there, just the the research done on this is so. There's a lot of surveys. There's a lot of surveys. Yeah. But the the physiological measurements mm -mm. we don't have yeah. them. We don't have them. We need them real bad. <laughs> yeah, and and that's where you got to take that next step with the the lab based or field based yeah. stuff um, mm -hmm. to get that in there. But yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I wish I could do more for more groups <laughs> i just i'm It'll only one person there, you know but, We're, yeah, it's the baby field <laughs> it is it is and i don't know have you guys heard of the performing arts medicine association oh, yeah okay of good so you know <laughs> um yeah. you know i mean i've only been involved with them for a few years now but from what i've read and from you know the conversations i've had is you know their organization and the field has just exploded in the last mm -hmm. 20 last couple years, years right yeah. And even more so yeah. in the last, you know, 10, it just seems like it's yeah. just taking off exponentially. So that's great um, because hopefully, you know, more and more of those gaps will start to be filled. Um, yeah. yeah. Yep. And mm -hmm. the, the foundation's already there, like sports science and, and health yeah. and wellness, like it's all there and it all applies to musicians. We just got to figure out what the little tweaks are that, that mm -hmm. need to be made to make it, you know, industry specific. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. It's always shocking to me how, when you go looking for research that's specific to musicians, injury prevention, strength training, any, in any of that, it's minute. Minimal. Yeah. yeah. Compared to the volume of, of literature that's out there and the research that's out there, it, that niche, I mean, and compared to how many musicians there are who deal with yeah. this, those numbers, mm -hmm. the, like, the stats are so high. It's like, 
Yeah, the, the, the field is ripe for the picking at this point. So it's like, yes, yeah. and people are really now on board and willing to be part of that. Like, yes, let's bring these numbers in. Let me be part of the research. Let's let's foster this and make it into something that can benefit people later down, down the line. You know, yeah. Yeah. really yeah. glad to see that finally. And the research you're doing, I think is super important. And it's so eye-opening. You know, every time you post yeah. something on Instagram, I'm like, it's just so cool. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's been fun. All of it. Has. Well, curious. Of, uh, go, go ahead, go ahead, Angela. No, I'm going to take us down a totally <laughs> no. different direction. Still, you go ahead. Well, so is mine. <laughs> Mine's completely different. I'm just. I was just going to ask if you had a favorite drummer you worked with, or like a, you know, something oh. that was particularly mind blowing that you just was like, I didn't see this coming. Uh, I mean, in terms of a favorite drummer I worked with, I, I honestly, I mean, I, I have certain ones that I really particularly liked working with, but I can't really say that I have a favorite. And even if I did, I can't say that out loud. <laughs> no, right. that's, why I that, that's not what I really mean. So, no, I know. You know. Um, <laughs> say, what's I, the most I've famous had... person you worked with? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I had some of the data has been super interesting. Like, you know, I told you about Todd's data being like, whoa, this was really unexpected. And yeah. others who, um, you know, the numbers were so high that it was like, ooh, wow, that's substantial. Um, in terms of, I mean, the experience of doing this, I mean, taking off the scientist hat and putting on the rock fan hat, <laughs> this has been, I mean, my, I've had some really incredible experiences. One in particular, I, and actually this one, maybe this is a good story um, in terms of good experiences. Ever since I started the study, I wanted to work with Barry Kirch of Shinedown, uh, partly because I love Shinedown, but partly because he posted at the time he was pretty active on his social media and he was posting a fair bit about like fitness and, and things like that. So I was like, he's perfect for this. I really want to, you know, so I eventually through the different connections made it to his inbox and uh, he agreed to do it. And, and he was, I mean, he's just such a great guy. He was so much fun to work with and he's lovely um, and, and put up some great numbers and actually had real, a lot of fun with it because at the end of his show, he took his shirt off and wrung it out on stage and it was like oh. buckets. <laughs> it was so gross, <laughs> but it was awesome. <laughs> so, you know, but uh, okay. it, from a, from a personal note, um, you know, at, at one point or before he went on stage, he told me, okay, you know, at the start of the encore, at the start of this song, uh, it's simple man. And so there's like a good minute, minute and a half mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. where there's no drums. So he's like, come to the drum riser and we'll, you know, we'll take a picture. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, we'll just like quick selfie and he'll get back up there. He brought me up on his drum riser during the show and we took a picture and in front, like there's 15,000 people out in the crowd and I'm up on the drum riser with Barry while we're taking a picture. And I, so I still like that story still puts a smile on my face every time. So it's like, I never imagined when I decided to do a PhD that this is where I was going to be. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, he, he was great. He was so much fun. And, and so many of them have been and, and just so excited to be part of it and, and see their data. And, you know, a lot of them have been great about like, promoting it like they post they repost the data because they want to show like look how hard I work and, you know that kind of stuff <laughs> right, right. so that's that's been really cool so yeah really really neat personal and professional experiences doing doing this research for sure that's so fun and I have one more thought along that same line where you're okay. you're saying that he was he was already po um posting a whole bunch of stuff about fitness um do you do you see that uh I'm not exactly sure how to phrase this, but sometimes we think of musicians as not the healthiest people, which is not the best kind of stereotype. When mm -hmm. it comes to drummers, I feel like that stereotype can go one way or the other. What mm -hmm. have you seen in regards to how uh, drummers, the drummers that you've seen, how they take care of themselves? Has it been kind of a split of it either they do or they're really into it or they don't really much at all? Or is there really some middle ground? Um, there's probably a lot of middle ground, but a lot of the, a lot of the drummers that I've worked with have said that they work out almost on a daily basis. Um, I, again, to be able to do what they do. 
um, you know, Barry in particular, actually the whole band, they, they bring like, they set up like a, uh, basically mobile weight room in one of their trucks and they work out together every single day, pretty much. Um, yeah, which is fabulous. Right. Love so, that. but a lot of them do yeah. a lot of them said, you know, yeah, I, I walk or I run for half hour, an hour every day. I do this, that, and the other thing. Um, some, you know, may have different habits that are maybe less on the healthy train, but also they do work out or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, some of them are vegan. Some of them are not at all. Um, which is fine, but like there's, so there's just so many differences, but I did find that probably more often than not, they were reporting at that level, they were reporting that they, they work out fairly consistently. Um, so, which was really interesting to see. Um, yeah. It would make sense yeah. if they're getting up to like 197 though, <laughs> beats per minute on their heart rate monitor. Like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, if that's, if that's what my performances were like, I wouldn't want to not have cardio capacity. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. It's um, nice to buck that stereotype though of, you know, the, the, you know, I don't want to go down yeah. that you know, path. It's just, you're a you know, lazy stone or whatever you play drums. No, 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 no. You've yeah. got to be at a certain level um, and you've got to be able to take care of your body. So it's nice to hear that other side of, of that from yeah. somebody who's actually studied drummers. It's nice yeah. to hear that. And I've had that conversation with several of them too. And the, you know, that, that kind of behavior, like the stuff that you see in the seventies and the eighties and like the, the drinking, the drugs and the partying constantly and all that, that, that just doesn't really fly anymore from a, like musician, like a music quality perspective, mm -hmm. you just can't do that anymore. Um, because I think the, I mean, there, there's lots of factors, but part of it is just, there's so many bands out there now that you can't, you can't potentially impact your performance. You can't go out on stage drunk and off time as a drummer and disappoint 20,000 fans. They're not going to, especially now where like, there's no buying CDs. So they're not going to buy your merch. They're not going to come to your next concert. So you, you yeah. can't do that anymore. And I, I feel like, you know, most of them, or at least most of the ones that I've talked to about, you know, yeah, we can, we can party and we can have fun, but like, this is my job. This is my profession. I take it. I wouldn't show up drunk to teach my class. Why, or, or, right. you know, why would I show right. up like that? to play my show. And, and that seems to be, that's an attitude that I've seen a lot, um, which, which I think makes sense and is great. Again, it's nice to hear that because, you know, stereotypes exist for a reason, but some mm -hmm. of them should also die. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yes. Totally. Yes. <laughs> Didn't mean to be completely derail you there, Jen. I Totally oh, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, like I said, I was going to take us in a totally different direction. Um, so I'll just jump off something else you said, which was, you know, I wouldn't show up drunk to teach my class. So I'm like, okay, yeah. well, let's talk a little bit about education then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> perfect um, segue. <laughs> perfect segue. <Beautiful. laughs> Not at all awkward. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so... We know that you have a uh, Grammy Foundation grant. Is that yes? Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> For, actually, um, it used to be Grammy Foundation. Now, actually, I said Grammy Foundation previously, but it's Grammy Museum. Actually. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, do you want to tell us about that and how it maybe relates to that comment I made that was maybe less than appropriate? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, uh, yeah. So the grant is to study the reasons why drum instructors either do or don't teach their students about injury prevention. And the, the foundation for that grant came from that first survey I did. Um, and actually, our, I just published an article, it just came out this week um, in the Journal of Popular Music Education, where I compared the rate. So one of the questions on the surveys was, did you take formal lessons? And if so, did your teacher teach you anything about how to prevent these kinds of injuries? So I compared the rates of reporting an injury in the drummers who had been taught about injury prevention versus those who had not, including those who took formal lessons, but just weren't taught anything about injury prevention. 
Mm -hmm. The group that had learned about injury prevention reported about half as many injuries as the group who did not. So twice as many injuries in the group that was not being taught about this. So clearly education plays a role here. Um, and that's without me really digging that deep into like what I did ask, what were you taught? But I mean, the, a lot of the answers were very like, you know, good technique. Well, what does that mean? What does good technique mean? Yeah. So I didn't really dive too deep. I just like, yes, I was taught something. No, I wasn't. Um, so I kind of wanted to know, okay, well, if, if this is how this is going down, if, if education is clearly related to lower rates of reporting injuries, why aren't more people teaching it? Why are there still teachers who are not doing it? Um, and I have my, I have my reasons and I, part of it goes back to what, or I have my suspicions and some of it I think goes back to not being taught about it themselves and not knowing where to get the information. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I need to look into it because there might be other factors at play. Um, so, uh, what I proposed was interviewing, uh, about 30 drum instructors to mm -hmm. ask them these types of questions about, you know, do you, or don't you, and why do, or don't you, and those sorts of, what are the barriers what are the reasons why yeah. that you don't do um, so that I can find out some of these reasons. And if I know why people aren't doing it, if it is a question of resources, then I know what I need yeah. to do. I need to develop right. some resources. If it's a question of, uh, well, I wasn't taught anything about it. So I don't feel comfortable teaching this myself. Then now it's time to advocate for this type of education to be embedded within a music teacher's training so that they have at least some idea or they come out of their four-year Bachelor of Music program with at the minimum, okay, here are some of the considerations and here's the resources. Here's who you should refer a student to if they're having a problem, you know, things like that, so that we can continue to try to stop these injuries before they start. Cool. All right, so you're, you're still in the uh, development phase of that then. And, and I realize this is a loaded question, but again, I'm not not really this deep into research myself. So um, okay. when do you think the results of that will come out? When do you expect? That's going to be a, 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 probably a couple of years. Um, I have okay. the grant is two years. Um, okay. It started uh, like in September. So I'm anticipating collecting the data uh, mid to late next year. And... Uh, actually, I shouldn't say two years. It'll probably be about a year before I have anything that I can disseminate in any way, um, okay. whether it's through my social media or that sort of thing. It'll be two years before I have like a academic journal manuscript okay. <laughs> to publish. Okay. But I, I do intend on publishing this in, in much wider venues than just an academic journal. So hopefully in about a year, a year's time. Okay, so 2022, we'll look out for baby articles or baby info, and 2023, we'll look out for the full, the bigger full one, shebang. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully. Yep. <laughs> That's the plan. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Nadi, this has been an amazing, amazing uh, time. Thank you so much for, for talking with yeah, us. Thank um, you. Where thank you. can people find you if you've got articles published? or they want to get in touch with you, where can they find more about you and what you do and get in touch with you? Okay. Well, thank you guys for having me. Uh, this was super fun. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation too. Um, where people can find me, uh, social media is probably the best place to see what we're up to because I do post about the lab's activities regularly. My handle is the same on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It's at Dr. Nadia Azar. Uh, I do have my faculty webpage at the University of Windsor. It's not a very simple, it's like lots of backslashes and numbers and stuff. So it's not a simple, you know, one-off website. Um, I, I could send that, but I mean, really social media is probably the best place. And then if there was something that you wanted, um, like, you know, if you wanted a copy of an article or something like that, they could just message me and I can either direct them to my website where they can find it or send it to them directly. Excellent. We'll put that for sure in the show notes. Do you have yeah. a, um, and then uh, the website you're talking about is the one with all the backslashes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my <laughs> university one. Actually, I should say too, um, I do write for Drumio and there is a section on their website uh, that is dedicated to the drummer lab. That's where most of the energy expenditure results are. But a couple of the articles that I talked about today, I have written for them on 
uh, how to manage playing related injuries and what the most common ones are. Um, those can be found on their Drumeo, the Drumeo beat um, in the health section. Perfect. Okay. We'll be sure to add that too. <laughs> to yeah, I can, I can send those to you or after, uh, you know, we end today, I can drop them in the chat or something like that. So that you have perfect. Them. Sounds good. All right. Thank you again for joining us. This has been wonderfully enlightening and we really thank you for the research that you're doing. It's super yes. necessary. I'm excited to see it. It's super fun to see all these drummers that you hook up um, and their results. Please keep posting. It's super fun. Oh, I will. As soon as I can get back to it, I, I'm like chomping at the bit here. So <laughs> yeah, hopefully sure. soon, hopefully next year we'll get for to sure. it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. Yep. Yeah. And thank you guys for joining us. Yeah.